Ready? Tell me when. Good. All right. So Parshas Baluscha, our subject is the Sefer Torah that has not been finished being written. Okay. Today's ideas are primarily from Rav Moshe Shapiro, Zichron Levracha, and there's a piece which you'll see, an attachment from my grandfather, of Shimon Schwab, my uncle Mayer in Denver, took the Hebrew Sefer, of my grandfather's Hebrew Parsha Sefer, the Mayan Bay Sashaweva, and he took most of it, not all of it, translated it into English and added some anecdotes and some stories. It's beautiful, it's this Sefer. Rav Schwab on Chumash, beautiful Sefer, <coughs> and uh, there's a piece in in our in our in our topic today from my grandfather. <coughs> if you look at Sefer Ban Midbar, okay, you find that the beginning that the first the Ban Midbar, Nasso, and the beginning of Bahaloscha all are very thematic. Ban Midbar, Nasso, and Bahaloscha, the first two and a half parshios are about the, the last wrapping up operations, the last necessary instructions and operations in preparation for the Jewish people to proceed into Eretz Yisrael. Now you realize that from Mat and Torah till now, not much time has passed. Basically there was Harsinai, then of course the whole story of the Egel, which you're going to relate back to today, because as we said, if you had to identify what the sin of the Egel was, what was it? What was it? Making an Egel. Saying, Ela Elohecha Yisrael. It was externalizing our source of inspiration. There it is. It's that. Okay? Uh, then what happened was, of course, Moshe went on the mountain to Bidavin, etc. Came down on Yom Kippur, said, Solachti. They started doing all the preparations for the Mishkan, which would be the way to draw Hashem back into the midst of Am Yisrael after Hashem departed because of the Egel. They finished the Mishkan on Yom Hashmini, Nisan, and now it's Er, and they're just getting ready to move on to Eretz Yisrael. Nothing has happened yet. The Miraglim and the whole thing hasn't happened yet. So the first two and a half Parshios of Sefer Bamidbar, Bamidbar Naso, beginning of Baloscha, essentially are the wrapping up operations about how they should camp and when they blow the trumpets and how they should move and how they should travel and that, all that kind of stuff. And then after that, suddenly, suddenly you see this uh, strange two pasuk, like in, you know, con self contained uh, section. And after that section, everything goes downhill. You start getting the Jews complaining, and then there's a magefa, there's a plague, and then they complain about the man, and then Moshe says, I can't handle it, so then Hashem says, fine, I'll make other neviim, and then there are other neviim, and so then Miriam and, you know, and Sipora, Moshe's wife, were talking about, oh, wait till they hear about what happens when your husband's a navi. You know, and then so they spoke Lashon Hara about Moshe, and then the Maraglim didn't learn a lesson, and they spoke Lashon Hara about Eretz Yisrael, and then da 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 da, and this generation never went into Eretz Yisrael. So we're going to examine this, this, these two psukim in the that divide up between the like the first half, which was you know setting us up to just immediately go to Eretz Yisrael, and the second half of Sefer Bamidbar, which everything goes out of control, malfunctions, and we get stalled for 40 years, okay? So if you look on page 786, okay? The last, last uh, in, in, is, topics are Moshe discussing, requesting Yisro to stay along with Am Yisro, okay? Right? And uh, Moshe says it'll be such a benefit if you stay with us, etc. And right after that, look at Pasuk Lamed Gimel. It's it, they're about to go to Eretz Yisrael, and it's not a very long journey. Not, a, not even two weeks. But look at the words in Lamed Gimel, okay? By Yisu Mehar Hashem. Can I have one of the notes, please, also? By Yisu Mehar Hashem. We don't have enough? Not enough notes? Is there one table right No. Here? Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Does, if anybody needs more notes, should we have the office make more? Yes. yes. Okay. 
Um, Lisa, Lisa Reich, could you run into the office and ask them to make 10 more? How many people need? Just raise your hand. Like 10 more. Yeah. 15. Um, thank you. So, thank you. So, so um, it says like this. By Yisu me Har Hashem, they traveled from Har Hashem three days. The Aron, this Aron's, everything today is about the Aron. The Aron Brit Hashem and the Aron with the bris with Hashem. No sale if Nehem is traveling in front of them. Derech Shloshet Yamim, three days. Latur Lehem Menucha to assure for them, to stand up for themselves. Menucha. The Anan Hashem, so the Aron's in front of them, you know, and uh, preceding them and uh, setting this, the ground for them that it should be. It should be secure and safe. The Anan Hashem Aleihem, and the cloud of Hashem is upon them, Yomam, during the day. Benasam Min HaMachana, when they now travel out of the Machana. We're going to come back to these Pesukim at the end, and they're going to have a deeper meaning. All righty, then just the Pshat. And suddenly here, two Pesukim surrounded by two upside down nuns. Okay? This isn't a safer Torah like this. Two upside down nuns. And everybody knows these psukim. Where, where, how are they familiar to us? Shabbos morning, we take out the Torah. We, you know, we we hear it often. Shabbos morning, as women, vayhi bin soa haaron, and when the aron would travel, vayomer Moshe, Moshe would proclaim, kuma Hashem, arise Hashem, v'yafutzo aivecha, scatter your enemies, misanecha mipanecha, v'yanusu misanecha, and your those that are your that. Uh, that are opposed to your enemies, those that hate you should should, scatter, should run away from before you. When it's settled, Yomar, it says, Moshe would say, Shuva Hashem, settle down Hashem. Revavos Alpha Yisrael, myriads, that's always Rashi's going to tell us, 22,000. And right after that, Vayihi Ha'am Kemisonanim. Everybody started complaining. Now, first we're going to look at Rashi, which is right here on your sheets. What is this? Oh no, she printed the wrong one. I'm sorry, it's Bahar Bakukhosai. All righty. All right, everybody, you're going to have to, we're not going to bother her. It's the wrong email, it's my fault. I opened the email. Okay. All right, you'll get it by email. Forget about the notes now, you're going to get it by email later. Okay, everybody listening? TanyaHammer at gmail.com, you will get the notes. Shh. So you could use them to write your own notes on. All right. So what happens here? All right. What happens here is that Rashi. Let's start with Rashi. Okay. We will start with Rashi. What does Rashi say on on the um, What does Rashi say on here? Vahibin Soa Ha'aron. What does Rashi say? Pasuk 35. Anybody see? Asalo Simanim, Milafanav, Milacharav. Torah made Simanim symbols before and after. Lomar, She'ein Zu, Ein Zemikomo. This is not really the right place for these two Pesukim. Okay? So, Lama Nechtav Khan, why are they written here? Kadei lahafsik ben paranos le paranos to separate between two punishments. Questions. This is not its right place. Why not? It seems like it's its right place. It just says by Yisu me Har Hashem. They traveled from Har Hashem, and the Aaron went in front of them. So why is this not the right place? Second, where is the right place? That's number one. Where is the right place? Number two, what punishment? The last thing we heard is Vayisu me Har Hashem. What is the paranus? What punishment precedes it? We know what precedes it, what, what follows it. They started complaining, and then there was a magefa, there was a plague, right? They were complaining about their, their lot in life. A fire burned among them. We know that. And number three, why nuns? Okay, three questions. It seems like it's place, so why not? And if so, where, where is its right place? Number two, um... What's the paranus? What's the punishment that precedes it? And number three, um, number three is why the nuns. Okay? So, 
Number one, I want everybody to do, well, uh, to analyze these two psukim, okay? I want to notice some interesting quirks about these two psukim, okay? Count the number of words in Pasuk 1 and count the no number of words in the second Pasuk. But he bin Soa has how many words? Twelve. Twelve. And Ubeshuva has how many words? Seven. Seven. Nice. Okay. Interesting. How many words does the first Pasuk in our Sefer Torah have? Barashas, Bara, Elohim, Esa Shamayim, Esa Aretz. Seven, just like the second, just like the last Pasuk in this little section. And how many words does the very, everyone flip if they want to, if you got it. How many words does the very, very last Pasuk of the entire Torah have? Must be 12. Ulakol Hayad HaChazaka, Ulakol HaMora, look at the word. Ulakol Hayad HaChazaka. The, and everything, the strong hand, look at the next word, Ulechol Hamora, okay? Hagadol. Mora Gadol means the awesome power. Asher Asa Moshe Le'enei Kol Yisrael. So wait a second. Our Torah starts with seven, ends with twelve. This one starts with twelve and ends with seven. How many letters, I won't make you count, are in these two psukim? The answer is 85, okay? Now I'm going to read you from the Gemara, because you... It's in the notes, which you will get. This is Gemara Shabbos, okay? This is page 115b, all right? Let's listen to this. The Gemara considers the pers permissibility of saving a deficient scroll. When, when, a, when a Sefer Torah is puzzle, okay, when do you save it? Okay, in a fire or something. If it's... If it's, if it's not, it can't be used. Rav Huna Bar Chalov inquired of Rav Nachman. A Torah scroll in which there is not sufficient writing, in other words, you can't distinguish, you can't identify enough writing, enough letters, to gather 85 letters, okay? In other words, most of the writing of the scroll is erased, and the number of intact letters in words scattered throughout the scroll does not total 85 similar to the number of letters in the section that begins by he bin soa ha'aron, okay? May we save it from a fire. If it doesn't have 85 letters like this, these two psukim, if it doesn't have that minimal amount, do you have to save it? Clearly, if it has 85, you save it because 85 discernible letters in a Sefer Torah constitutes a kosher Sefer Torah because these two psukim have 85 letters. <coughs> Okay, what are we beginning to see? Okay. Why do you inquire about a complete Torah scroll? Inquire about this section by Hebin Soha Aron. In other words, whether we may save a parchment containing just this section alone. In a case when this section is missing a letter, what if it only has these two psukim and a letter is missing? Now the Gemara goes on a lot to discuss this in all kinds of variations, okay? What the case is. And then the Gemara continues. So it's clearly that they're considering these two psukim as the paradigm for kosher Sefer Torah, correct? The Gemara goes on to continue on the next page. I'm skipping a bunch, all right? Uh, on page 116a, all right? Um, about Now we're going to deal with some of the questions that uh, Rashi brought up. Remember we said here... Having mentioned, okay, having mentioned the section of Ahi bin Soa Ha'aron on the Gemara in relationship to kosher Sefer Torah, the Gemara now digresses with further comments on it. The rabbi taught in a brisa, Ahi bin Soa Ha'aron, the section, the Holy One, blessed be he, made signs above and below at the inverted nuns. In other words, he placed markings immediately preceding and following this section to enclose and separate it from the rest of the Torah to teach. This is Rashi, this is where Rashi gets it from that this is not its proper place, okay? Rabbi o Rebbe says, no, it is not for this reason that the signs appear, okay? But rather because this se section ranks as a Sefer Torah Bifnei Atmo. The verse says Sefer Chashuv, it says Sefer Chashuv Mipnei Atmo. It is a significant Sefer, Rebbe says, it is significant Sefer in and of itself. The reason it has two nuns is because these two psukim constitute its own Sefer. Okay, so 
with whom does the, so uh, with whom does this following statement made by Rav Shmuel, by Rav Nachmani, in the name of Yonasan agree? Scripture states, Chatzva Amudeha Shiva, wisdom has built her house. She has unit out of seven pillars. Elu Shiva, Shiva Sifrei Torah, seven books of the Torah. Okay, in accordance, these in accordance with who with whom what with was this statement made with Rebbe? According to Rebbe, there are seven books in the Torah. There's Bereshis, Shmos, Vayikra, Bamidbar, up to these two psukim. These two psukim, which is a sefer, chosh of bifnei asmo, a sefer that is very important in and of itself. The end of Bamidbar is six, and Dvarim is seven. So right away, we have a couple of things here. We have that these two nuns bracket this. According to Rashi, doesn't bring down this second uh, this piece about it's a safer chashav. Rashi says it doesn't belong here. Question is, it, we still have our same question. It seems to belong here. And if so, where would it belong? We didn't answer that. Number two, okay, what is the paranus? We didn't answer that. And number three, why nuns? We didn't answer that. But we have a fundamental idea now that we're going to work with these two psukim and the nuns that se- that separate them teach us that this is a separate Torah. And we know now we just learned that we base the we 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 learn from the fact that this has 85 letters in it that what constitutes a safer Torah is 85 letters. Okay. We also saw that the first pasuk in this safer Torah is equivalent in number of words to the last pasuk of our safer Torah, and the last pasuk of this safer Torah is equivalent to the first pasuk of our safer Torah. Correct. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Why such a small safer? The two nuns are the hint to that. In Amos, I don't remember the chapter and verse, but it's in your notes. There's a famous pasuk, Nafla lotosif kum besulas yisrael. You know that pasuk? Yeah. Nafla, she has fallen. But lotosif, she will. Do, you can read it two ways. Nafla lotosif, she will fall no longer. She will arise, the maiden of Israel. Okay? There is no nun in Ashrei because of, it represents the word no fail. We've fallen. Instead, in Ashrei, what, we're, what do we have instead? Samach. Samach. Hashem lechol hanoflim. Hashem surrounds all those that fall. <coughs> so that if you fall, we don't want to talk about the falling part. We want to talk about the part that if you fall, you are still protected by and surrounded by and included in Hashem which is an idea we work with a lot, right? So this two psukim, these nuns, mean that we're looking at a failure here, a falling. There's a falling that happens here, a nephila. But no nephila, no falling is forever. They're always, in the end, it's within a context, and we will be supported. So mech Hashem, Hashem supports, uplifts, strengthens, restores all those that have fallen. What is happening here? In order to understand this, we have to look, ask our first question, our second question, what is the paranus? Okay. The only words we see is, Vayisu mehar Hashem. So my grandfather here in this piece explains that it's very odd that the Jewish people traveled away from what they referred to as Har Hashem, the mountain of God. Because we know that as soon as the revelation of Har Sinai was completed, and we know that after, it means that Hashem went up from the mountain here. Vayere Hashem alahar, Hashem came down, and then after the Seres Adibros, Vayel Hashem, Hashem went up. First of all, what does Vayere mean? A very important idea from my grandfather that we've taught many times. Hashem doesn't move from place to place, and Hashem is not like concentrated more like a solid or you know, more diffuse like a gas. It doesn't change concentration. He's more here and he's less there. Okay? Remember what we said about Chesed? We're all included equally in the existence of Hashem. is isn't, isn't more or not. Vayered means that in that experience of Har Sinai, Hashem allowed himself, the understanding of himself, the perception, the apprehension is a good word, the capacity to apprehend Hashem. Hashem, so to speak, descended into the lower capacity of a human mind and let the humans who are on a lower level, apprehend him in a more clear way. That's called descending. And Vayal means he removed, so to speak, restored us to our natural state where it is beyond our comprehension. 
Okay? But where, after this happened, which means it was a nevuah that we experienced and then it passed. But when this happened, that mountain, Har Sinai, that this kind of was associated, this experience was happened in front of or associated with, after that, the chauffeur blew. And Moshe announced that now, unlike what, how it was before, everybody was warned to keep away, keep away, keep away. Now, you could go up the mountain, you could pasture animals on the mountain. The mountain was a regular mountain. And it continued to be a plain old regular mountain from that moment on. And they've been there a long time. And it was just a regular mountain. So why would it be called Vayisu Mehar Hashem? So my grandfather explains, because they wanted to keep it that way, that that mountain is a place where God is revealed. In other words, just like the Egil. Externalizing your source of inspiration. It's over there. I could go to it at will, and I could not go to it at will. My inspiration isn't in me, it's outside of me, and I can, I can focus on it, I can open myself to it, I could close myself to it. It's not me. The externalization of the source of our inspiration. That's by Yisu Mehar Hashem. And when that happened, that is the punishment. Because the next two psukim, and here's our Moshe Shapiro, Zechorna Levracha, the next two psukim were meant to be the first and last psukim of an entire Sefer Torah that has not yet been written a very large Sefer Torah. It was meant to be that the Aron, the Jewish people, would travel, and the Aron would go before them, and they would journey to Eretz Yisrael, and in Eretz Yisrael, they would identify completely with the Aron, with the Kavod Shamayim. It would become part of them. It would, it would be expressed through them. And that story was meant to be written, but that's not what happened. What happened was because their, their inspiration was outside of them and not inside of them, they started complaining about the, their situation. You know, when you see, when you love someone, you just see the good in it. You don't start complaining about it. It's not an object outside of you that you evaluate whether it's good or bad. It's part of you, right? The fact is that it wasn't part of them. And therefore, they started complaining. This isn't right and that isn't right. We can't deal with this or that, and everything spirals out. The next, what, what, what really follows after Vayisu Mehar Hashem is Vayi Ha'am Kemisodun, and they started fetching. They started blaming. They started pointing fingers. They started saying, you know, objectifying everything and seeing if it, you know, the deal that was, they were, they were, they were, they had their needs, and Hashem's, the situation Hashem put them in, uh, had its problems in their eyes, and they were, tr you know, I, you know, exp expressing the, the distance between who they were and what was happening to them. So in this, right here, these two psukim are inserted. Now what happens here? Okay, we know why the nun, we know why they don't belong here, and we know that it's a Sefer Torah, okay? What happens here? The Aron is going in front of them, okay? To, to, to set up a place, to, to, to make their journey one of manucha, but there can't be any manucha because it's not in them and you don't have peace of mind when, it's some, when your inspiration is outside of you. You're always fighting with it. So they go in Territ Yisrael, but they, don't, they do not, of course, maintain that situation in Territ Yisrael. And eventually the Aron and the beautiful <coughs> building it was housed in and this city that, ha that was the makom of that beautiful building, the Beis HaMikdash, that housed the Aron, all of that was eventually lost. And the Aron was hidden. Where did the Aron go? Now was the beginning of the opportunity for Am Yisrael to internalize the Aron, the Beis HaMikdash, Yerushalayim, the whole thing. It had a, we didn't have it anymore. We were disconnected and separated from it. Where did the Aron go? So look at the word Aron. Remember this Sefer Torah? The first Pasuk is our last Pasuk, and the last Pasuk is our first Pasuk. Read Aron backwards. No Ra. 
Nora. Now I must have my notes here for one second. Okay. Hold it. The Ara now. We are going to now analyze the word Nora, but we are familiar with the word Nora because we have it as part of where is it? Where is it? Where are we? We have it. Uh oh, where is my Baharba Hukosai? Hold on. Hold it. Where is it? Tanya. We have it as part of Shmona Esrei, correct? Yeah. Where is that? I have to go into my Google Docs. Hold on. Um, we have, okay, so what are the words in Shmona Esrei? Hagadol, Hagibar, Vahanora, correct? Oh my gosh, where is Bamidbar? What the heck is going on here? Oh, here no, Bamidbar, no, I mean, what is, where is Bahaloscha? Oh, here it is. Okay, got it. Baruch Hashem. Okay, yay. Okay, so, I'm going to read you something. So we say, Hagadol Hagibar Vahanora, correct? Okay. It's almost hey Bez. Okay. Also, one more thing I want to point out. Rashi says, when it says, Veshuva Benocho Yomar, when arrested, Moshe would say, Shuva Hashem, Revavos Alpha Yisrael. Revavos always relates to 22,000. What's the number 22? 22 letters in our Aleph base. The Sefer Torah is written with 22 letters, okay? Here is a Gemara, Yuma 69b, about that, that those three words we use in Shemona Esrei, okay? Hakel, Hagodol, Hagibor Bahanora. All right? Because the Aron is Nora in a different form. Okay? What is that? Why are the sages of those generations, the early Second Temple period, called the Anshe Knesses Hagdola? Why is that their name? The men of the great assembly. <coughs> it is because they returned the crown of the Holy One, blessed be He, to its former glory. They returned the crown. We have spoken about this. Okay? They returned, they restored the crown to its former glory. How so? Moshe came, I'm going to do this all in English now. Moshe came and he said in his prayer, Hagadol, Hagibor, Vahanora. Yirmiyahu, the prophet, came and said, Gentiles are desecrating your, 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 your holy place, and the minions of Nebuchadnezzar are doing terrible things in your sanctuary. Where is your Nora? Where is the awesomeness? And he took it off. He, therefore, he did not say awesome in his prayer. Okay, that's the third one, Nora. Nora is awesome. You're Miyahu. Okay. And he just said, the, he said, use Gadol and Gibor, but not Nora. Daniel, who's after him, came and said, Gentiles are enslaving your children. Where is your Gavura? Where is your might? Therefore, he did not say mighty. Just said Gadol, okay? Okay, so what did Anche Knesset Gadola say, the men of the Great Assembly? What did the, the, these leaders who some of them still had Navua said? No, no, no. You can say Gibor and you can say Nora. And we're just going to focus on the Nora one. He says, Hain Norasav. You want to know what the Norasav of Hashem is, the awesomeness of Hashem is? If not for the mora, where do we just see the mora? Where do we just see the word mora? Huh? The last pasuk in the Torah, right? If not for the mora, O Shela Kadosh Baruch Hu, Heyach Uma Achas Yechola Leskayim Ben Haumos. How could one nation have ever survived among all the other nations? Okay, what is Chazal? And then they put back Nora. So here's what we're saying. The Aron, okay, like Har Sinai, like the Egel, spent its time with the Jewish people in the first temple era, 
as an external source of inspiration. You would go to the base of Migdash, and there would be so much pomp and ceremony, and all the Leviim in their costumes, and the Kohanim in their costumes, and the whole big thing, and the Karbanas, and the Avodah, and in there, the Kodesh HaKadoshim, in the holiest place, the treasure was the Aron, and you say, and with the Kruvim, the, truly the inspiration, Hashem spoke through the Kruvim, everything was out there, externalized. But after the Chorban, it had to come into us, it had to be internalized so that we carried it with us wherever we went. And it internalized in the form of Nora, the miracle of Jewish survival. The fact that the Jewish people have survived among 70 nations for all this time, that that's the number 70, all the nations, that is the Mida of Nora. Now, let's take that further. The Hashem's Nora being in us, how, do, how does it express itself? If we know it means that the Jewish people will always survive because of this Mida. How does it express itself? And in order to understand how it expresses itself, we have to put it together with its two counterparts. And we're going to go back to ideas that you should be super comfortable with now and familiar with. The first three phrases in Shemona Esrei, Hagadol, Hagibar, Vahanora. Godol is referring to which force? which Mida, and Mida doesn't mean a personality trait, it means a force in play in the universe. One of the forces that Hashem, that, that is a dynamic force that is always in play, that is part of the, how Hashem runs this world. Chesed. And who is associated with Chesed? Avraham is Chesed. Av, the word Godol refers to Chesed because it's all-encompassing. Okay? Chesed is associated with Ahava, which is the gematria of what? What well, gematria of Ava is? 13. The gematria of Echad is? 13. Ava and Ava, 26. Love for love. Two takes two people to love each other. Echad for Echad, two people relationship. Yud Kei Vav Kei is? 26. Yud Kei Vav Kei is? Haya Hova Yia Hashem all surrounding us. We're re working with an idea that we've all been familiar with, so we're not going to go back to it. Chesed, Godol, love, inclusion, oneness, participating in God's existence, being part of it completely, always. There is no option. Enod Milvado, right? The muscle we give for the billion time, the fetus in the womb. But there's an issue. Chesed alone, that we are entirely part of Hashem's existence, okay? That is fundamental in our consciousness before we start anything. The world begin. Notice this. The first force in play that brings a world into existence is chesed. Olam chesed yibaneh. Olam, a world, chesed yibaneh. Chesed builds it. Does not mean that Hashem conducts the world with chesed. It's not talking about how Hashem, what Hashem does for people. That is not what chesed means, as we've stressed here many times. Chesed is not something you do for another person. Chesed is that everyone else is part of your existence. Avraham, the beginning of a nation, of monotheism, and ultimately the Jewish people. The Jewish people, his whole ideology is born out of chesed. He opens his door on four, his tent on four sides and says, you are all part of my existence. That gives birth to a new nation, an ideology. <coughs> Rus, the beginning of Mashiach. What's her mida? She identifies completely with Naomi. Naomi's needs are her needs. She's part of Naomi, Naomi's part of her. No boundaries. Correct? Everything begins with the Chut Shel Chesed. By the way, Esther in the Megillah, who saves Am Yisrael, is this also described as having Chut Shel Chesed, inclusion. Everybody is part of her identity. Okay? Now, but the pro think about it with mother and a child. It is absolutely fundamental that in the steep and securely in the psyche of every human being is their feeling of belonging, attachment, being part and integral to someone else. If this attachment is tampered with, the problems and the pain and the suffering know no end and are so devastating that people will take their own lives. If when a child comes out of the mother's womb and the child knows because it grew in the womb that it is part of the mother, and then this mother treats the child like an outsider, like a stranger, hurts the child, abandons the child, neglects the child. The child does, is not wanted. 
that we can't deal, it's not, it's not um, you know, something that a human being can absorb, can integrate very well. This lack of attachment to something that you are by definition mm -hmm. attached to. And, uh, and it causes a tremendous amount of suffering, correct? But if a person is part of someone else's existence entirely, yes, it's beautiful, you're provided for, and you're integral, and you are part of it. But you don't have a self. You're not a separate person. There's nothing to do. You just exist off the other person's existence. It must be there in the beginning, but then is there, and the next stage is required. And what is the next stage? The birth, the separation, the evolution of an otherness. I am an other, I am a self. What do we call that? Now we're going to the next stage. Yitzchak, Yitzchak. At the Akeda, what madrega did Yitzchak reach? Wait, no. At the Akeda. The pinnacle of Avraham's Mida, of Chesed. The pinnacle. He, he did not have a self. He was absorbed back into HaKadosh Baruch Hu. His life was given freely back to God. There was no holding on to my own separate existence, my life. There's no self. There is no otherness at all, right? So what does Hashem say? I wanted to see if you got there, if you reached that higher stage, that you completely experience yourself as part of Hashem. Now that you reach that stage, Come down from the Akeda. Now we start the next phase, separation. Being another person. Being a self. Come down. Go back to the real world. You got to get married. You got to be a, grow your crops. You got to build a family. You got to deal with politics and all this stuff. Now Yitzchak's Mida was what? Gevura. And just like Chesed is associated with Ava, Gavura is associated with Yira. Yira is hold, holding back. Now, what is that? In order for a child, or for Am Yisrael, and this is where the Gullus begins. Remember, the Gullus begins with Yitzchak, with Yitzchak really, right? With the birth, but not till later. Yitzchak is the beginning of the concept of Gullus. Um, the beginning of separation. So in a child, in Am Yisrael, okay, there is that evolution into the self. In the beginning, it's this, and th you know, in those early years, the child wants to be their own person and know, and they have to do everything themselves, but they are not ready to give up that protection. They keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Eventually, something kicks in and a desire emerges to be a real separate entity and, you know, you know, the go out and seek our own fortune, right? To uh, be a separate entity. And in order to let someone be a separate entity, the parent, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, has to step back and not interfere and let them learn on their own and make mistakes and all of that. Yitzchak, and here you could associate this with Buddhism, where, where we diverge. Yitzchak had to go into the world. But Yitzchak was very aware, which is what the Buddhists are basically afraid of, okay, that if you enter this world as a separate entity, you will f get lost in it. And suddenly you will identify with finite physical things like houses and cars and jewelry and looks and money and professions and, and status and all that stuff and, and career. These will become who you are. And you will use these things to define yourself. And you will compete with everyone else who is trying to use whatever they have to define themselves. And you will be lost and forget that you are part of something. And you will be, you know, you know, you know, um, you know, what's, you know, uh, pursuing your own identity full speed ahead as if. What you create for yourself is who you are, and it's your identity. And you will be driven to kind of like, as a Tselem Elohim, do something in this world. And you will use your otherness and your separation to do something that in the end has no lasting value. Like the whole Kohelis has no lasting value. Hevel Havalim, it's all fleeting. 
You're going to work so hard to establish yourself as an individual and what you stand for and who you are, what you acquired and what you achieved, and it's all for nothing. What's the point? And now we get to the real question. Why would Hashem do this to us? Why does Hashem want us to, at the one hand, feel completely part of Hashem, which gives us nothing to do, really? Nothing to add. Like Shemitah, that's when we feel it. Shabbos, stop, we don't do anything, and guess what? The world keeps going perfectly. Actually, the world doesn't need us. If we don't cure cancer and Hashem wanted to cure it, He would cure it Himself. We don't raise the sun up in the morning, we don't cause the wind to blow, we don't do anything here. We plant, we do things, Hashem could do that without us. Like, what do we actually do here? Why does Hashem want us to, on the one hand, be entirely part of Him, in which case we really have nothing to do? Hashem is doing everything. And the second hand, at the same time, give us a feeling of individuality and autonomy and, and, and something, you know, a sense of our own point of view and perspective and our contribution and our drive. Like, for what? To get attached to temporary things that give us a sense of separateness and otherness and then die? What's the point? And the danger is, with a child and with Amisro, that they will get so lost in their otherness that they will forget about their parents, forget about their home, forget about anything, and just, you know, end up feeling very, very much separate, but very, very much alone and insecure. And on that, you know, on that... That, uh, that wheel, what's that wheel that they yeah, spin on? Yeah, yeah, that's the wheel that those gerbils spin on, right? It's called a treadmill? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, why does Hashem do it? The reason, ha- and Yitzchak did not want to be caught in that trap. So Yitzchak was extremely careful to enter the world, but to stay very, as much as possible, disconnected from identifying with and attaching to all these finite things. Yitzchak is associated with Chesh ban Hanefesh, always questioning oneself, <coughs> judging oneself, pulling back, Yira, holding back. The Buddhists are very clear about this, these traps that this world is full of and all the false attachments that replace the real attachment to God. And so what they do, what they you know, try to, to accomplish is to, again, disconnect, just like Yitzchak, disconnect, pull away, try to meditate all the time, merge back with God, separate themselves from all these attachments, they divest themselves of all their possessions and their clothing and everything, you know, just like the ascetics and the, from the Christian, you know, all the ascetic traditions that separate themselves from everything. Marriage, speaking, eating, everything, okay? That's not us. Now comes Yaakov, okay? The question is, what the dangers of separation and otherness we know. What are the benefits? Why did Hashem do this? What benefit? And we talked about this too. You could refer back to Bahar uh, but refer back to, I think, Bamid, where we did a whole share on this. Why did Hashem give us this powerful feeling of detached, separate, autonomous existence? For what? There's so many risks involved. And, by the way, we could have put all those risks and all that damage in one category. It's called Chilul Hashem. From the word Chalal. Chalal means, I'm alone here. I'm not surrounded by anything. There is no God here. I'm alone. And I'm trying desperately to establish and secure for myself an identity as an individual that matters, that will be remembered, that did something. And I'm using all these temporary things to do it. And it's all not working. In the end, as Shlomo Melech says in Kohelis. So uh, why does Hashem do it? What's the potential benefit of this otherness that we know ourselves to be? All good. There's one word. Good. Here's the word. The, the strange phenomenon that Hashem instituted, created, in, put into play in this world. Hashem could do everything. Hashem doesn't need another to do anything. As we said with Shemitah, Hashem can cure. We say it all the time in davening. Hashem could cure the sick. Hashem could make the rain fall and crops grow. Hashem doesn't need anyone for anything. There's only one thing that Hashem cannot do by himself and cannot do for himself, and that is kavod. Remember the whole shir on kavod? We said a lot of stuff. Go back and refer to it if you weren't there. Kavod is a very strange thing. 
You, if you beg someone to give you kavod, what's that? If you pay someone to give you kavod, what's that? If you threaten someone to give you kavod, what's that? Kavod requires another person. Okay? Kavod requires another person. And the kavod is a free will gesture that is, emerges, that grows in another person out of appreciation. We talked about this. And, and, and not just appreciation, the sense of privilege that here is someone in the human condition, right, who I pretty much view as perfect in their midos, in the way they behave, and how they conduct their life. And everything makes sense. And I want to be close to them. So I, that's ahava. I want to be part of their life. Slave. But I also don't want to... A slave. A slave. Very good. And I don't want to offend them or do anything that's, that would make myself unworthy to be in their presence, so I hold back, Yira. Same type of interplay, right? And I can't believe that I'm worthy to be appreciated and loved and included by them. That's covered. I, by, I, I have covered for them, and there's no greater covered than the fact that they have covered for me. Kavod is something that requires another person. Kavod cannot be imposed upon other people. It's a fraud. It's an absolute fraud. We teach our children kavod, and Kabir es Avicha is on the first side of the Dibros, on the Ben Adam Lamakom side, because they have to know, they have to at least have a framework for when they're young, for Chinuch, and as they go, what constitutes kavod. But in the end, kavod isn't just a show. Kavod is the real thing, Okay. Covered, hopefully by treating your parents with covered, you begin to have covered for them. But in the end, covered is something that emerges from appreciation and, and, and admiration and inclusion in that person's existence is the greatest covered of all. That's why our neshama is called covered. Ura kavodi. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens here? We are other. We experience ourselves as others in order so that we can do one thing in this world. It's the only thing we're here to do. Be the source of kavod for our Kaddish Baruch Hu. The Aron that traveled in front of them, that they externalized, that was the place of kavod for Hashem in the beginning. That's where the Luchos were. That's where the Kuvim were. That was, so where in the whole of the world is the location and the item that houses the kavod of Hashem, you'd have to point to the Aaron. But the long journey of Jewish history, which hasn't fully been written yet, which starts by he bin soa ha'aron, the Aaron would travel, but not in the form of an Aaron. Backwards, looking at it backwards, in the form of Nora, the awesomeness. The Anshik said, you can call Hashem Nora, because the Nora now is the survival of the Jewish people, which is beyond comprehension. But what is it in us that causes us to survive through everything? Not just physically survive. The spirit that is the, the, mot- the impetus, the engine, the fire for our physical survival. And here I want to digress for one second. This is, Rina Fuchs, Fuchs gave me this book. It's so good. Incredible by Rabbi about Rabbi Yossi Wallace and his father of Yidel Wallace, and there's a story in here uh, that he he didn't even like to t- tell the story because he wasn't sure of the facts until many people who were there corroborated it. It's a story. I'm not going to say it now because it's late, but uh, it's about you know the, just in a nutshell. He the, he was caught in the camps. The father uh, putting on tefillin. They took him out to make a. a a show, a demonstration of what will happen if anyone's caught with tefillin. <laughs> tefillin. They put him on a table, they put a noose around his neck, they're going to hang him. And some Nazi, you know, Hashem using everyone, says, uh, what would your last request be before you die? He says, I want to die with my tefillin on. So they gave him his tefillin, and he said to everybody there, so you see, I am the winner here. I am dying with my tefillin on, kavod, and they cannot take away from me, basically what we're saying here, that I am the source of kavod shemayim. This is what they're trying to destroy. So you know what the said, oh no, you're not dying like that, get off the table. <laughs> <laughs> and they beat him, but he survived. 
It is the sense, the nora, what causes us to survive throughout the ages. In our day-to-day -day life with all our tsaras, and as a nation, it is that the awesomeness, the aron, the knowledge in deep in that we are the source of kavod shamayim in this world. And if we are not the source, there will be no Kavod Shemaim in this world. And a world without Kavod Shemaim is a world that ceases to exist instantly. No one knows their creator, no one knows anything. There's no world. We must be, and we never give up on this, and it's our mission, and it gives us strength to be the source of Kavod Shemaim. Yaakov, which is always associated with Golos, is Nora, Hakel Hagadol is Avram, Hagibor is Yitzchak. Nora is Yaakov. Yaakov is associated with Gullus. If not for that awesomeness, what is the most awesome thing out of all? The Nora, which is called the Mora here, that we know we are the source of Kavod Shemayim. The Aron is in us in the form of Nora. That, is, that defines the whole history of the Jewish people. This pasuk, okay, by Heben So Aaron, which has 12 so words, like the last pasuk in the Torah, that is the first pasuk of the Sefer Torah that is still in the process of being written, the journey of Jewish history. In that Sefer Torah will be the stories of our ancestors by name and by person and place. Who did what? when and how they did it. The whole history of the Jewish people is going to constitute a brand new Sefer Torah. Sefer Torah, Sefer Chashev Bifnei Atzmo, the seventh pillar that's not written yet. And people we know, people in this room for sure, hopefully everyone, are going to be written in that Sefer Torah. Who's writing it? <laughs> it will be written in the end of days. That Sefer Torah is being written. And the last pasuk of that Sefer Torah will be Ubeshuva, when the Aron finally settles. Now, Lehielsen, when the Aron finally settles, it'll settle on Revavos Al Feishol, 22,000. That's the, the magical number, the constituting how many people you need for the Shechina to rest. The Shechina will rest, but there's 22 letters. Okay? The Shechina will rest in the story of the Jewish people. That will, ex that will display the Nora, and that will be the Aron, but it's a different kind of Aron, non-physical Aron that we're carrying with us. Now, one last thing. This Sefer Torah is surrounded by two nuns, no fail. Yeah, this journey is a long journey, ups and downs, but the Nefila is, con is contained in the Samach, in the Somei Hashem Lekol Anoflim. We are never abandoned. It's just another way of bringing the Kavod Shemayim to the world. First it was external, now it's internal, okay? And, um, and the, 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 the last Pasuk of the Torah that we read, remember the last Pasuk, what did it say? L'chol hayad ha'chazaka, the very last Pasuk in the Torah. L'chol hayad ha'chazaka. What's the next few words? L'chol hamora ha'gadol. Asher Asa Moshe Le'ene Kol Yisrael. Okay? The whole, the powerful hand of Hashem and the great Mora Gadol. The great, tremendous amount of awesomeness carried with us, which keeps us always secure because we know two things. On the one hand, we are part of Hashem Gadol. Mora Gadol. This is the two words, always go together. On the one hand, we are completely part of Hashem. We are always protected. Hashem made a bris with us. Remember the Pesukim we read in the beginning? And yet we're separate in order to be a source of kavod. And we do it. And that's the Nora. And that's the miracle of Jewish survival. And all of that is going to be eventually taught in Somech, surroundings, protecting, uplifting. Somech. So, Mir Tashem, we should see this new Sefer Torah that we are all in, written speedily in our days. One second, one second, here, can you just get her, get her comment?
Speak to the camera. She said, we always juxtapose Chilo Hashem with Kiddush Hashem. Go on. Can you say it louder? We always juxtapose Chilo Hashem, which is as if Hashem isn't here. It's empty, Chala, with Kiddush Hashem. And Kiddush Hashem doesn't mean full, actually. Kiddush Hashem, that's Kiddush separate Correct. Very good. Kiddush Hashem is always mufrash, where you separate, and separate in that you engage in the world and use everything as a source of kavod shemayim, but you do not identify and attach to these things for your identity. By the way, I just want to mention one thing. We said that too much attachment, too much detachment too soon, abandonment, is terribly painful. But too much attachment also doesn't work. It is the balance between attachment and inclusion and detachment and separateness. Right? That fine balance. That's Yaakov. That's Nora. That's parenting. That's friendship. That's everything. Have a wonderful week.